we can start today lesson and I'm gonna be the one teaching today. So yay. Go white to Alfredos. And now you're gonna figure out very soon why to Alfredos. Uh, so because we start with the other Alfredo. <laughs> So today, uh, summary is going to be the following, right? This is the table of content. We start with a little, little bit of review about uh, matrix multiplication, um, just my interpretation, like my point of view. Then I'm going to be telling you about input data, which are going to be, in this case, talking about input signals. So we're going to be extending the uh, matrix multiplication for signals, and we're going to be, we're going to be ending up with convolutions which uh, exploits some property of my natural signals. Finally, we're going to be seeing some interactive Python interpreter uh, with PyTorch. So let's get started. So we're going to have here linear algebra recap. All right, so whenever we have a neural net, usually we can write that our hidden layer, and here I'm going to be using a bar underneath uh, a letter to represent that is a vector. Okay, so this is my h vector. It's going to be a nonlinear function f applied to my z. And what is z? z is my uh, linear rotation of my input. Okay. So I can write here z equal some matrix A times my x. So let's say x is uh, dimension n, z is going to be dimension m. Therefore, what is the dimension of A? Anyone from home? Can you guess? How many rows? How many columns? n by n. That's because we are going to be having as many rows as the dimension we are shooting towards and as many columns as the size of the dimension we are shooting from, okay? So let me just expand this one as the classical, you know, just expanding those symbols. So I'm gonna have A11, A12, until ta 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 A1N. Then I'm gonna have A21, A22, until the last one, A2N. And then I go down until the last row, which I'm gonna have AM1, a M two until A M N. Okay. And then I'm going to be multiplying this one by my vector X. So I'm going to have X one, X two, X N. All right. So whenever we multiply a matrix times a column vector, Usually, I would suggest everyone thinks about doing this operation. You take this first row and then you multiply by this column, right? This is going to be like a, a inner product, which is this one times this one plus this one times this one plus this one times this one. And so we have usually in mind this kind of representation, row times column. So I'm going to just write it down to be, uh, you know, just writing down the obvious. So we have now that my matrix can be written as being my first row, A1, then I have my second row, A2, until I get the last row, AM. Okay, so these A's are already rows. And then I multiply this one by my vector X. So if I multiply this one, I'm gonna get something which is gonna be like here, which is gonna be A1, x a2 x until i get the last one a m x right so first another question what is the size of this element over here what is it one right so this is a scalar and so i have one two until the last one which is m so i have m scalars Sweet. And so this one is going to be uh, my vector z1, z2, until I get down to the zm. Okay. 
All right, so let's now uh, think a little bit what each of these elements uh, are, okay? So let's have here the generic term, a rho vector times my x. And let's assume now that my n is equal to, okay? So what is the, uh, what is the output of this uh, operation here? How can I compute the uh, value here? I just said before, right? This is gonna be this item times this one plus this item times this one, right? So I just write it down. We're gonna have a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2. Right now, since we are in two dimensions, I can also draw this here, right? So I have here a couple of axes, and I'm gonna have my, let's say my X. So this is gonna be my X. And this angle here is gonna be Xi. This point here is gonna be X1. And this point over here is gonna be X2. And then similarly, I'm gonna have my a here, and I'm gonna have my A1 here. This is gonna be alpha, and then it's gonna be my A2 over here. So I can just write this with some trigonometry. How much is A1? It's straightforward, right? To tell me how much is A1, right? Can someone tell me how much is A1? Yes. So no, it's actually wrong. Uh, what is A? <laughs> okay, uh, the cosine cosine alpha, I guess. But you also had you have also to multiply by the by the length of the vector, right? So A one is going to be uh, the length of the vector times the cosine of alpha, and then I have the other one is going to be the length of the other vector times the cosine of psi plus. I'm gonna have the magnitude of A times the sine alpha times the magnitude of X times the sine of psi, right? So I can take those factors out. So I'm gonna have the magnitude of A, the magnitude of X times cosine alpha cosine psi plus sine alpha sine Xi, right? Uh, how much is this stuff over here? From high school. You were just a few years ago in high school. Can you tell me how much is this expression? You're very quiet. It was more than 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, no, it's not equal to one. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, cos alpha minus uh, Xi, right? So this one, it's simply equal to uh, the two, okay. I can just write it here. So this is gonna be the cosine of alpha minus Xi, right? Or, which is the same as saying cosine of Xi minus alpha, right? Because uh, the cosine is a even function. So first take away, okay? Whenever you multiply a vector with a matrix on the left, right? You basically have this multiplication, this scalar product between this row and this one, each row and times this one here. Each item over here will represent up to some uh, constant, which is expressing the length of these vectors, the degree of alignment between these two vectors. So if these two vectors are both pointing in the same direction, the cosine of zero will be one. And so you're gonna have the highest value. If these two vectors are at 90 degree, you're gonna get the cosine f of pi half is going to be zero, right? And so this term will be turning to zero. Otherwise, if you have one vector in this direction, the other vector in the other direction, you're gonna have the cosine of pi, which becomes one, uh, minus one. And therefore, you're going to have the, uh, sorry, the minus one over here, right? Multiplying, of course, the uh, these two factors. So whenever you think about a matrix and vector, you can think about matching this value here 
which now we're going to be calling kernel. So my A, which was in pink, so this guy over here is called kernel. And therefore, this multiplication will be called, so the kernel is like a template, right? So this is called template, template matching. So you simply check how much is the scalar projection, the scalar scalar product, the geometric projection uh, of the given signal or given uh, symbol, like given vector towards each of these kernels, right? All right. Um, one more interpretation, which I really like, is the following. And usually people don't see this. Uh, when I talk, when I explain this during the office hours, people were like, oh, and so I had to show it to you as well. Otherwise, you don't do all. OK. All right. So we said that this to get these items, I do this item. Well, we do this one times this one, this one times this one, this one times this one, right? So this first item gets multiplied by this item here. This item over here also gets multiplied by this one. This item, the same, and this one as well, right? So the entire first column gets multiplied by the first item over here. Then we sum it to the product of this item times the second one. Maybe I had to make a square. So we can do this one here. Then I do the second item times the same square. Then I have this one times the same item and the final this one here until, and then I get a plus here. And then I get this item here over the last one this item over the last one here, and then so on, right? And so you can express this matrix, uh, matrix vector multiplication in this different way, right? So I can write this one as being my A1 vector column. I have A2 vector column until I get the last one, which is going to be the nth, because we have n column, right? And then here I multiply this by my vector x. And this is equal to my vector a1 times the first component of my uh, x plus the vector a2 times the second component plus so on until the a3 times the x3, right? And right now I'm going to be asking you a quick uh, like I'm going to make an exercise, right? So let's say a uh, x is one hot with the x x uh, x vector, right? X j is equal to one, right? So if you multiply a one hot vector, like a matrix with a one hot vector, what do you get? All of these x's are going to be zero, right? Only the jth item is going to be set to one. And so you can immediately see that if you multiply a matrix times a one hot vector, you basically select the j, jth column, right? Does it make sense? Yes, no, you already knew everything? Yes, okay, you already knew everything? No. You already seen this before? No, okay, so yes. <laughs> All right, I'm confused, I'm asking too many questions. Yes, I know. All right, another one, which is a different exercise, is going to be the following. So let's say uh, my x now is actually a n class probability, right? So what is the outcome of multiplying this matrix times an x that is containing probability? This is p1, p2, until the pn. Now oh, this should be n, sorry. You can answer. No one answers. What do you have? So if these are probabilities, like if this, they sum up to one, right? Like similar to this one. Uh, yeah, a probability of an outcome. So if you have, these are the probability, like the summation, the like the, the one norm is equal to one, right? And all items are positive you basically get an expectation, right? Because you sum all the items multiplied by a probability, right? And so automatically you can compute an expectation 
by doing a simple vector, uh, matrix vector multiplication. All right, so this was the first part. Then we're going to be switching to the second part, where we are talking about um, natural signals. So let's see what are these natural signals. We start here with usually the user definition. Whenever we do like machine learning or whatever, we have our x, curly x. It's going to be the collection of these uh, x. So here I don't use the bar because I, I can use the bold font, right? So these are vectors because I use the bold. And so here I have one sample. Given that this bold x, this vector x, i is a data sample, and i goes from 1 to m. And these are my input samples. Right now, we're going to be switching to some more generic and powerful representation. We're going to talk about this input x as being the set of these xi's, which are functions mapping my domain, omega, towards rc, where c is the number of channels we have. So at a given location, the omega, or a given time, or whatever, a given item in the domain, I'm going to be associating a specific value, x, i. Okay. So let's have a look about this domain and channels. What are they? So for example, if I just have a one-dimensional signal, omega is going to be just the sequence of natural numbers, one, two, three, and so on, until I reach the total length of my signal, the total time and I divide it by the sampling interval, right? So in this case, this uh, fraction is equal to n, if I think ab about having n different samples, right? And so this is a subset of the natural numbers. Um, and then what is this RC? So RC C could be like one, two, like one would be like a monophonic uh, signal, right? So I'm like speaking in this microphone, which is super cool. <laughs> And right now I'm just recording one single stream of information at different time intervals, right? And so that would be a monophonic signal. Or I can record, I can switch the knob and I can record whenever I want to record music, I can have like a stereophonic. And so I have two values. So I'm gonna, I no longer have a scalar, now I have a vector at each timestamp, right? So I have a stereo signal. Or who can guess what is five plus one? Talking about audio, what is five, uh, five plus one? Yeah, surround system, Dolby surround, that's correct, right? So I have here my Dolby 5.1, 5, 5 .1. okay, okay, so you're actually following, that's great. Um, but definitely we can go for a higher dimensional signal, right? So a signal that is on defined on a higher uh, number, like a, a larger domain. In this case, I'm gonna have my domain it's going to be a Cartesian product between these two sets. The first one goes from one to height, and the second one is going to be from one to width. And these are a subset of the n squared, not the natural numbers, right? Squared. And let's see a few examples of Cs, right? So one is going to be a grayscale image. Three is going to be the classical color image. And so let me actually go in the detail here and tell you a bit more precisely how this mapping works, right? So my X at a given location, omega one, omega two, will have three values, which are R, G, and B. Each of these are again, scalar fields, right? Each R, R is gonna be a scalar, G is gonna be a scalar, B is gonna be a scalar, but then I pack three of them together. So I have a vector of size three at each location in the grid. Right. Um, we can still think about an image as being like one data point and still get back to this first original representation over here. But it's much more convenient to use this other representation. Actually, we go usually back and forth. Uh, but if I consider this uh, representation, I can exploit uh, properties of this signal that are inherently determined by these locations, okay? And so we are gonna be doing that in a second. One more example, but this is gonna be a bit tricky perhaps. If, uh, oh yeah, the last one here, I didn't tell you, sorry. So 20 is gonna be a very classical example of hyperspectral images where you have like 20 bands. So there are 20 different 
uh, wavelength, you're going to be recording uh, these kind of images. They are not images, they are hyper, hyper images, right? Okay, okay. So now it's going to be a bit tricky, perhaps. I'm going to tell you what do you think is going to be the following. My omega, my domain, it's going to be a R4 times R4. Who can guess from home? What is this stuff? What is R4? Do we have any physicists in the room? Well, in the Zoom room. Time, uh, quantum, quantum physics. <laughs> it's, this is space time, okay? So R4 is space time. We have um, space plus time dimension. And the other one is gonna be the four momentum, right? The derivative. And if you have uh, space time and four momentum, then you can compute, for example, the uh, a scalar value, which is gonna be corresponding to the Hamiltonian of your system, okay? So these are all kind of crazy things you can do with these kind of signals. All right, so an example of very simple example of 1D signal is going to be simply my x square bracket k, which indicates that this is a discrete um, sampling process. And I have my x1 item, x2 item, and so on. Okay. All right, so let's extend the notion of matrix multiplication to these signals. Extension to signals. Boom, all right. So how do we do this? So let's start now with a initial matrix, which is going to be three uh, item in, the, in these three columns, right? So I'm gonna be calling these columns here as lowercase k in this case. And then here I'm gonna have my signal, right? which has to be three items, right? Since you have three columns, right? We just figured that out. But then we're gonna have that our signal definitely will extend over time, right? And so this stuff will be going down a lot. And so we have to extend this matrix, right? So we had to make it larger and larger, right? So my question now is gonna be, what do I put here, right? And so we take out the first property of uh, signals, we're gonna talk about this first property. So we had that natural signals have locality. So uh, natural signals, natural signals are local. What does it mean? It means that things may happen within this region, like the things that happen here are quite uh, uncorrelated with things that are happening down, down, down here, okay? We only care about small regions. And so in this region here, which would be like, how do I take care of the items down here? Well, I don't want to take care of them, right? Because I uh, know that my signal will only have something that is meaningful within a small region. And so we'll put a big zero over here, okay? And so locality gives me sparsity. So here we're gonna put a big zero, okay? Um, cool. So let's have here my, uh, this first item here, we're gonna call it, let me draw it in a blue. So I have here my A1, okay? So I have my A1, Let's just call it A for the moment. And then we said we have zero here. And here I have my signal, which is long. So whenever I multiply um, these two, I'm gonna get something that is here. It's gonna be my A times my X restricted to the interval one, two, three, okay? But then we're gonna be using a second property, okay? So now we're gonna say that natural signals are stationary. What does it mean is stationary? Stationary means that what happens here may happen over here and may happen again over here. 
So I am interested to check whether this specific template over here appears over here, appears over here, all across the signal. Since these signals are stationary, I expect to show the same type of pattern happening over and over again, okay? And so this one leads to parameter sharing. which means that I'm going to be simply reusing the same A here. Or maybe I should have done in blue. Let me do it in blue. And so I'm going to be using the same A one step down here. A, this was A, was A1, right? And so, I just keep repeating this one down, 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 down until the last one. And so if I just compute, oh, oh, it's missing something here. Okay. So this was the first element here, was A times X one to three. Then I had a second item here. This is gonna be A times X, which goes in this case two times four until the last one which is going to be A times what? So I reach the end of the signal, right? And let's say this thing is long N. So I reach the N here, and this is gonna be N minus, uh, well, N, N minus two in this case, right? And what is two? In this case, two is gonna be K minus one. So question for you, how many items do I have here? You've been following? Uh, N minus two, yeah, exactly. Because I have one, two, until the last one, N minus two. To be more uh, generic, we're gonna be writing this N minus two the whole n minus two as n minus k minus one, okay? So this is the total uh, length of my signal after the convolution with a kernel size of k. So now someone should complain and say, oh, Alf, you forgot something. What did I forget? Well, I forgot there were other kernels over here, right? There is this one over here, and then there is this one over here, right? So what happened to them, right? I just computed, I just computed this first guy, right? And so let's finish up with the other one. So we are gonna simply repeat, right? So we're gonna have this matrix here. I had the first one, the second one until the last kernel. Okay, and so I'm gonna have all the colors, yeah, the blue, yeah, the green, and then you have the orange. And so each of them will have a corresponding matrix. Oh, we didn't say how these are called, right? So how is this matrix here called? Oops, too long. So this guy here is called toplet matrix. Okay, and a toplet matrix is of course sparse because it has all zeros here and all zeros over here and has this diagonal that goes down, down like that. And so if we consider all the stack of these kernels, right? Each of these are a kernel. So this one will lead toward to like as many, um, as many toplet matrices, right? So this is gonna be my like one, two, until the M one. And so if I just draw them quickly, we're gonna be ending up with something that is like, uh, let's say like this. And then I have, and then let's see if I can cheat. Oh, oh, I messed up. Copy, paste. A second one, 
color and the green one and then you had the third one paste and then we had color and then see i have become an expert of this stuff all right and so this is going to be giving you a stack of toplets matrices and eventually you end up with not just one output but you're going to have the first output you're going to have the second output right and then you have the third one right and so right now we started from a signal here which was how much was the depth here well the depth here was one in this case my channel was equal to one right let me write it down mm, which color should we choose okay so here my oh, oh too thick here my channel was equal to one right so in this case we started with a channel equal one and we end up with a channel equal three okay so how do we deal with this right so how do we how do we perform convolution after this, right? So actually, let me reshape this one in this way. So this would be the last one. This would be the second one. And so we can think about this one as being like, this is my face, front face, and then it goes up this way, right? This is second one. Okay, I cannot draw, sorry, because I don't have space. <laughs> okay, this was the last one, Tuck. something like this, okay? Uh, and we go up, Tuck, like this. All right, I made a mess. Um, so what is the difference now? How do we how do we keep going? How do we apply a convolution to this one? Well, it's not a big deal. So it, this one works in a very similar way if we have more channels, right? So in this case, we only have one channel, but we can use a stereophonic signal, okay? For example, I'm gonna have my signal over here, or maybe I can do it on the bottom side here. So let's say I have my signal, which is going to be like that and then I have two channels okay and so how do we compute this convolution well the kernels now instead of being like here they had like just one channel in thickness. Now we're going to have a kernel which has more uh, thickness, right? So we're going to have the, the kernel stack, which was three item. Now we're going to be also having some depth. This was the first one. Then we go the second one until I get to the last one. Okay, and so, and this one keeps going down, 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 right? And so how do, how do you compute this uh, scalar product? Let me move a little bit here. Okay, so this is gonna be like a scalar product. And so the first one was the, this one. So we have the first kernel, like here, we apply down this direction, right? We had three items here, one, two, three, two in the thickness, like this, and then we go down, bam. So each multiplication, so this one times this stuff over here is gonna give me just one value, right? So this is gonna be my first first item over here and then as you move down you get all these items so then you're gonna get the second kernel right and similarly you go down you get all the other one ta -ta 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 -ta, until you get to the last one right uh oh 
which was this one over here. And boom, you go down. And so you get those output, right? And so this is how, uh, how it works, right? So here we were, we started, we started with these metrics, which we saw that is like a, both a template matching, or it can be this one, which we didn't even write what it is. This is simply a scalar um, linear combination of the column, right? Linear combination of the columns of A, right? And then we saw that we can extend the data that is uh, down here by, and then we can modify our matrix to be having a big zero over here. And then we start sliding the same kernel over again, because we use parameter sharing since the data is station, the signal is stationary. And we have all these big zeros because we only lo look for local uh, interaction. We don't care about things that are further away. And for the final part, if there are no questions, you're very, very quiet, or you're enjoying the lesson, or everyone is asleep. I hope you are enjoying the lesson. I am, at least. This is the third time I'm teaching it, and it's getting prettier and prettier every time I go over. Uh, enjoying. OK, that's great. Fantastic. Thank you for the feedback. And so finally, we're going to be looking at how do we deal with the 2D kernels. So 2D kernels are, oh, OK. Yes, I'm getting there now. Uh, so how do we deal with 2D kernels? First of all, let's make sure we understand these numbers. And so we're going to be uh, playing a little bit with uh, PyTorch, OK? So something I want I already show you perhaps a few times is that you have a repository from last semester where you have all the instructions for how to get Conda running on your machine. I usually like to do this such that I can quickly prototype things and, you know, I don't quite use... I don't want to use the internet, right? When I work, I want to be like quiet with my machine myself. So how do I play with this? I can do now uh, Conda activate uh, PyTorch deep learning. And then from here, I can do uh, IPython. And then I can do import Torch. And then from Torch, import and then If I press Control L, I will clean up the screen such that I can see what I'm doing. So let's start by defining my first signal. It's going to be x. It's going to be a torch.rand n of just one item, like one a batch of one item. And then I'm going to use a stereophonic signal. So I have two channels. And then let's say I have 64 uh, samples. OK, so this is going to be my first example of using um, uh, like a signal. It's no big deal. Uh, then let's say I have my convolution, which is going to be a nn dot conv. Uh, I press tab. I have auto completion one D. Okay. Oh, I don't know how to use this. I don't know the API. Someone say, oh, check online. No, I don't like to check online. So I just press question mark and I press enter. If I do that, I'm gonna see now the list of all the options that I uh, I can use. Okay. So we have like input channel, output channels, kernel stride, size, stride, and padding. So uh, let's say I understand this, OK? Uh, so I'm going to say here, my convolution, I have to say I start from two channels. So I start for a stereophonic signal. I like to get 16 uh, kernels. Uh, and let's say the size of this kernel should be 3, like we have done so far. So first question for my audience, what is the size of the weights? Of this convolution? Questions? I mean, answer. Uh, you had to answer on the on the Zoom because I cannot see things on the. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, sixteen times two. So we have sixteen kernels for sure. It has to do to have two channels in order to match the input. But how about this number three here, right? So the length of each kernel is going to be three. And the number of channels of these kernels must be two, such that it matches my input, right? And then I have 16 of them. So this one gives me 16 
two channels of size, like two, two channels and domain size three. Okay. Cool. How many biases do I have? Anyone? If we have 16 kernels, we're going to have 16 biases. Yeah. Finally, what is the size of my convolution applied to my X? And you need to answer because we don't go ahead otherwise. So you remember we we have 16 filters, yes. So eventually you're going to have 16 channels. So that's going to be sure. The first dimension is going to be one, which is mean it means I have one batch. Uh, 16 are the channels. And then what is the extension of the signal? We started with 64 samples, but then we saw that when we apply convolution, we go down until n minus k minus one, right? So k is three minus one is two. So 64 minus two gives us 62. And so here we go. You have one batch of 16 uh, channels of 62 in length. Uh, what does, what do we have now if I choose a batch, a, like a kernel size of five? What is the only difference we get now here? Anyone? 16, yeah. All right, so let's try to see how the uh, 2D convolution work, right? So let's start with my signal, which is going to be, again, this random, random. Uh, let's have a batch of one item. Uh, I'm gonna use a hyperspectral image. And then for the size, I'm gonna be using something that is uh, in height 64 and in width 128, okay? So this is my, uh, my, my natural signal for a hyperspectral image. So I'm gonna create my conf, which is going to be an n dot conf 2D. Again, if I don't know how to use it, I put a question mark and I press enter. And again, they say input channel, output channel, kernel size, stride and padding. So in this case, I'm gonna do again, input channel, we said 20 because we start with a hyperspectral image. Uh, we'd like to use our 16 kernels. In my filter size, let's say I'd like to use three for the vertical direction and five for the horizontal direction. So, okay, first question, which is gonna be quite easy. What is the size of my weights? Anyone? Maybe someone that has an answer already before or literally anyone because it's getting late. It's very similar to what we saw before. We have 16 kerners. What are the sizes of these kerners? You need to match the 20. Uh, yeah, and uh, that would be the output size. I asked what is the size of the weights, not the size of the output. But that would be the correct output size, which we're gonna see in a second. So the size of the weights is gonna be three and five, right? So we have these kind of patches, which are height of three, width of five, uh, 20 channels in depth, and then I have 16 of these items, okay? And then as uh, the same as before, if you check the biases, we still get the same uh, 16 biases. And finally, as Eric was pointing out, if we do, if we apply the convolution uh, to my input X and we check the size, we're gonna get definitely one batch of 16 in depth, right? Or 62 times 124. My last question would be, how do I uh, manage to remove this change in a domain, right? So we move from a domain that is 64 and 128 to a domain that is 62 and 124. Uh, if I'd like to keep the same domain, I had to change a few parameters here in my convolution. So first of all, I had to say, I'm gonna still use a stride of one, but then I'm gonna use a padding of one for right, uh, left and right, sorry, top and bottom, and then two for top, uh, fuck. Two for, one for top and bottom, and two for left and right. Yes. And then I need one more parenthesis. So in this case, only the only thing I change is gonna be adding an extra zero 
to the top and to the bottom of my input signal and two zeros on the left and two zeros to the right, such that whenever I compute the convolution uh, of X, it still preserves my 64 and 128 dimension. This is going to be quite important or it's necessary if you want to use some residual connections. You cannot really use the same residual connection if you get domain uh, changes, okay? And so this one was the whole course, the whole, sorry, the, the whole lesson today. I, there are, are there questions or was it just fine? Uh, <laughs> I mean, after the third time I'm teaching this stuff today, I think I was, it was very smooth. Uh, but also, I don't know, because you should provide some feedback as well. Are there questions? What, 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 did, you, what did you learn, actually? Uh, I learned <laughs> that coding is easy. I see. Uh, I, I hope you, so the, the, the first page, like the first, uh, the part talking, where I was talking about the, uh, matrix multiplication as a template matching and then the linear combination of the column. That's very, very important uh, to keep in mind, right? You have this kind of, at least in image, image, mental image, where you're computing the uh, projection, right? For the each item in the output of the multiplication. And then the other interpretation, which is again, the uh, linear combination of the columns. We are going to be using that in the lesson for the uh, graph neural networks. So if we don't, if you don't, uh, if you're not practical, if you don't, you're familiar with that kind of representation, it becomes a little bit uh, hard, perhaps. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, play with tor torch and, and try to get yourself familiar. If there are no other questions. We are done. No questions. Okay. Bye-bye.